Some people online had asked if I could tape this so that I could uh, share it with them. So, so anyway, uh, the talk here is, so you want to write a thrill. I've always loved thrillers. I started reading them when I was uh, fairly young. I, after I went through my science fiction phase in high school and in elementary school, I, I, I got interested in, in thrillers, and I was just completely captivated by them. Um, back then, uh, uh, two or three centuries ago, it was I was interested in Mickey Spillane and, uh, and uh, Alastair MacLean. Alastair MacLean was uh, sort of like the granddaddy of thriller authors, uh, uh, modern thriller authors. Uh, Ice Station Zebra, Where Eagles Dare, Guns of Navarone. He kind of, uh, he was a major influence on people like Lee Child. Um, Lee Child was, uh, told me in an interview, by the way, that's my, this is my website. Um, and if you go to bidonauto.com, you will find thriller author interviews that I've conducted with all kinds of very interesting people. Um, the, uh, and uh, those are just some of them. I'm going to lose some people at the top here if I keep scrolling down. But it gives you an idea. There, uh, Vince Flynn, Lee Child, Brad Thor. I mean, <clears throat> there are a lot of top thriller authors. Uh, uh, Carson Black. So if you go to my website, I have a lot of things embedded there on thriller writing, and, and these interviews are just loaded with fantastic advice by some of the top people in the industry. So what are we talking about here? What is a thriller? I find a thriller is not so much a genre. I'm going to say something radical. I don't think thrillers are so much a genre as they are a literary form. And I'll explain my reasons for that in a moment. But I do think that all thrillers have share some common elements. Some of the elements they have are about five of them. One is called high concept. That's a term that, I, that is borrowed from the movie industry. High concept means a, a startling, often outlandish premise that immediately captures the reader's imagination. Um, Black Sunday by Thomas Harris, where a terrorist group at, at the Super Bowl you know, takes over the Goodyear blimp and, and they're going to explode the thing over the Super Bowl. That is literally a high concept. Um, but the, the whole notion is it's completely outlandish. Or you think of um, the Da Vinci Code and the outlandish premises involved in that. Uh, Transfer of Power by Vince Flynn, where terrorists take over the White House. These are, these are uh, the high concept thing is very common to a thriller. It means that there is something extraordinary that's going on. The second thing is high stakes. They're usually life and death stakes, or the fate of the world, or the fate of the country is involved. Uh, in The Guns of Navarone by Alastair MacLean, you had a commando team of five people who were to take out these giant German guns that were well protected. They were in, a, a, in a, a rock face on a high cliff, and they were faced out in the Mediterranean Sea. The Germans had captured something like, or had trapped something like 6,000 Allied soldiers on an island, and they were about to kill them. And the Americans were going to come and rescue them with a, a, an armada of ships. However, these guns were covering the channel that the ships had to go through. And those guns were going to pulverize the ships as they would come through. So these commandos were hired to do the impossible, and that is to 
get over to this island where this, uh, these guns were located, climb these cliffs in the dead of night, take on the entire German army, and blow up and knock out the guns. High concept, high stakes. If they don't do it by, the, there's the ticking clock aspect, if they don't do it by a certain time, all these people are gonna die. So that leads and morphs right into the third thing. Courageous actions often involving violence in, over, in order to overcome the threat. The guns of Navarone, it's obvious these people go through absolute horrors along the way in order to accomplish their objectives. Um, uh, another kind of a thriller, Jaws. The Peter Benchley novel that, uh, that turned into the, the, such a fantastic uh, Steven Spielberg film. In Jaws, these three guys have to go out and capture or kill this enormous shark that has been essentially eating New England. Um, and uh, they have to take courageous actions throughout the entire thing in order to, in order to confront this, uh, this menace. Constant escalating perils. The key word here is escalating. In a thriller, the perils start at the beginning. They continue through, but they get worse and worse and worse for the hero or heroine as they, as they go through the story. Um, in a thriller called The Gray Man, uh, Mark Greeny, a young author from Tennessee, who has taken over the mantle of Tom Clancy. Uh, he uh, wrote a, a story where essentially it's like running a gauntlet. The hero of this is a skilled, trained killer who has to rescue a couple of children. There's another ticking clock thing going on. And he has to go all the way across Europe and go run a gauntlet of the top assassins and special operators in, in the world. From each country, there's like the, the, the best teams from Japan, the best teams from, you name the country, Russia and so on. And every stop along the way, he has to have, he single-handedly has to take on these other people who are trying to stop him before he gets there. This, the perils and the difficulties constantly escalate and at the end, it's the worst of all. He has to go into this fortified compound where the, there are you know, dozens of these trained special operator killers <clears throat> just waiting for him there in order to rescue the kids. Um, so a kind of a, a, a premise of a great thriller is, and an expectation is that you're going to have this constant escalation of, so that you're on a, on a thrill ride, you're on a roller coaster, and it gets more and more crazy as you're going along. Ties right into another element, a fast, relentless pace, a uh, race against time to stop the threat. There's, um, I want to uh, read from the dust jacket of a book by Matt Riley. Now, Matt Riley is an Australian thriller author who writes, he's not a great, in my opinion, on characterization. Uh, however, it is nonstop action from the word go, and it is insane over the top action. Um, it, 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 from the back, I'll just read an excerpt. First comes a horrific firefight, then comes a plunge into a drowning pool uh, with killer whales. Next comes the hard part, <laughs> as a handful of survivors begins an electrifying, red-hot, non-stop battle for survival across the continent and against wave after wave of elite military assassins who all come for one thing, a secret buried beneath the ice. You see, um, this fast, relentless pace in a thriller, it never lets up. And <clears throat> the slow spots, like in Jaws, where the guys are sitting around and, and, and they're drunk and singing songs to each other and telling the war stories and so on. <clears throat> um, 
It's only the calm before the storm. You know it's coming. Um, you've had incident after incident. It gets more and more horrifying as things go along. And finally, these guys are sitting in the boat and, uh, and they're, they're talking. But you know that the, the, the suspense is, is ratcheted up because you just know that, that it's going to be as worse than it ever was at the very end. The climax is always going to be the worst. So all of these five elements, the high concept, high stakes, courageous actions, constant escalating perils, and the fast, relentless pace are to lead up to one overall effect, and that is intense mounting suspense and anxiety in the reader about the outcome. The purpose is to compel the reader to continue to turn the page and turn the page and turn the page and not put the book down until they're done. And at the end, they will write reviews for you on, on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or whatever and say, I couldn't put that book down, you know? Uh, uh, you know, it's kept me up. I, I got a great compliment once. They, I, I can't remember whether it was the wife or the husband who said that they took my first book, Hunter, along on their honeymoon. <laughs> and, and I did not become very popular with uh, one of the spouses, because apparently the, uh, one of the spouses could not take their, could put the book down. Highest compliment I've ever been given. <laughs> Highest compliment. That's cool. I, I like that. Um, now, Thrillers can be distinguished from mysteries by a dominant emphasis. In mysteries, <clears throat> what you have is about solving a crime which has already occurred. And the pleasure that you get from a mystery is the cerebral satisfaction that comes from satisfying your curiosity about who done it. But something has already been done. And the satisfaction uh, comes also from the justice that results, uh, the, that the detective or whoever is trying to find out or solve the mystery, the justice, usually some injustice has been done, a crime has been committed. And the detective, the protagonist, is trying to figure out what happened uh, and who did it. And when they do, at the end, the, the villain gets their comeuppance. In a mystery, information is withheld from the reader, who is always one step behind the investigator, whoever the investigator is. And if you're a skilled mystery writer, um, you surprise the reader at, some, at many points along the way, but it's clearly at the end by the revelation of who actually done it. In thrillers, by contrast, the main focus is on a future impending threat and on action taken by the hero to stop the threat and often to exact justice in the face of enormous odds and perils and obstacles. In a thriller, the reader is often provided with more information than the hero possesses. And that adds to the tension and the suspense. Um, Will he discover the truth in time? Will he stop the bad guys in time? Unlike most detectives and mysteries, her heroes and thrillers work on deadlines. There's always that ticking clock aspect. There's always that impending threat. And the, the solution has to come the solution for the, for the hero has to come in a direct confrontation with evil to prevent the really, really, really bad thing from happening. Now, there are, of course, hybrids uh, of mysteries and thrillers. The, uh, the probing protagonist arouses the threatened culprits to retaliate. So you, a crime has occurred. The protagonist starts probing it, and then the bad guys come back at him. Then you can see the thing morphing into more of a thriller, where the uh, hero's life is in, in jeopardy. The heroine is uh, facing imminent threats, 
And so there is that new element of a future threat and peril to the hero or heroine. So you can get these blends. Uh, stories by um, Robert Crace are like that, where the detective goes out and he tries to uh, uh, solve some problem, and all of a sudden the bad guys start coming back at them. And so pretty soon the, 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 the thriller and mystery elements morph and blend. Robert B. Parker is another example of, of somebody like that. His, his famous Spencer novels, which I love, uh, those are examples where there are strong thriller elements in the middle of a mystery. Thriller subcategories are defined largely by the settings, the story settings, and they overlap in many hybrid combinations. For example, generic action adventure. John D. McDonald, Clive Cussler, Lee Child, uh, Wilbur Smith's book, Hungry is the Sea. Those are kind of a generic action adventure. But then you've got international espionage. Ian Fleming, Robert Ludlow, Daniel Silva, Gail Linz. And those international espionage uh, stories often blend with political intrigue and conspiracy where you have uh, stories like those written by Vince Flynn, Brad Thor, David Baldacci. Uh, my own second book, Bad Deeds, is in that category of political intrigue slash conspiracy thriller. Now, sometimes the international espionage and political intrigue conspiracy blends with military, the special ops guys. Uh, Jack Higgins' World War II novels uh, like The Eagle Has Landed. Alistair McLean's, I mentioned, The Guns of Navarone and his other uh, great book, Where Eagles Dare. Modern special ops novels by Clancy, Brad Taylor, uh, Andy, McNa Andy McNabb. You see, oftentimes, the blending of spy stories, political intrigue, conspiracy, military. Crime stories, my first um, crime thriller. Hunter is, is an example of that. Uh, Ira Levin's A Kiss Before Dying, wonderful suspense story, brilliantly written. He was, I think, 23 years old when he wrote the thing. It was incredible. Silence of the Lambs. Um, and then again, Robert Parker, Mickey Spillane, Robert Crace. They, all of these are, are crime thriller genres. Legal thrillers, another setting that has broken out from the larger thriller category. Scott Turow, John Grisham, uh, Michael Connolly's uh, Lincoln Lawyer series. Historical thrillers. Ken Follett is a master of historical thrillers. It started really early with him with uh, uh, Eye of the Needle, The Man from St. Petersburg. Uh, he does a lot of those things. Wilbur Smith writes great thrillers that are set back in the 19th century. Techno thrillers. Michael Crichton, Clancy again, uh, Dan Brown's Digital Fortress, uh, Disaster Apocalypse, think of the granddaddy War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells, <clears throat> you can call that a thriller. Uh, Stephen, uh, uh, there's a gentleman named Stephen Conkley, uh, his um, interview's up on my site, um, and Steve writes these post-apocalyptic uh, end of the world type of, uh, of thrillers. Medical, Tess Gerritsen, Robin Cook, C.J. Lyons. Romantic suspense, Nora Roberts, Linda Howard, or psychological uh, thrillers. Now, if you want examples of psychological thrillers, um, take any Hitchcock movie. Hitchcock's Vertigo, Rear Window. Those are excellent examples of, of, of a psychological thriller, and in those, what you have is usually not so much violence throughout, but the anticipation of violence. The psychological element is the worry factor of the uh, protagonist uh, who is, uh, uh, they are facing a future threat, and the tension is, uh, is ratcheted up, and their, their personal um, psychological uh, element is strong. Vertigo is a great example with Jimmy Stewart facing his literal vertigo problem. 
And um, the, the thrill suspense aspect of the whole thing is uh, who is this mystery woman and what has really happened in her life uh, and, and how, does she, how does she impact uh, uh, these curious events. He becomes obsessed with this woman. Uh, the talented Mr. Ripley, um, the Manchurian candidate. If you remember the movie, the wonderful movie Richard, based on Richard Condon's book, a Manchurian candidate where <coughs> um, all of these guys have, who were in the Korean War have this real weird psychological problem. And uh, in the movie, um, Frank Sinatra is trying to deal with his inner demons in order to figure out this conspiracy that's been going on. Many Westerns have thriller elements. Um, <clears throat> you take a, a classic like High Noon, which is a great, if you just took everybody and I put that whole thing in a modern setting, it has the perfect structure of a thriller. The impending doom, the uh, ticking clock, literally all the way through the movie, you, you know, flashing back to the ticking clock um, as um, Frank Miller is going to be released from prison, and he's vowed to come back to the town, and, uh, and uh, poor Gary Cooper has to stand up on behalf of the entire town that's unwilling to back him. And so uh, the, the stakes keep getting ratcheted up and ratcheted up, and the suspense keeps getting tightened and tightened. Uh, a final one I'll give you is horror. Uh, Stephen King, Dean Koontz, Ira Levin, Stephanie Myers. Uh, the horror genre's been fragmented into a thousand pieces now. It can, it, today it can include vampires, zombies, supernatural, science fiction, all of these different things as, as sub-genres of thrillers. Which is why, getting back to a point I made earlier, I tend to think of thrillers more as a literary form than as its own separate genre. Because there are so many ways to package those five elements I talked about at the very beginning. You can, all you have to do is, is put those elements into a fresh setting and you've carved out a new subgenre. You know, so you put all those, uh, all of those uh, five elements, the high concept, um, the high stakes, courageous actions, escalating perils, fast pace, throw in some zombies and you've got a new, new genre, you know? Uh, or robots, you know, your robots are going to Terminator, you know, futuristic thing. Uh, so I like to think that if you're writing in any genre, any traditional genre you can think of or uh, any one to come, you can import those elements, those five elements into it and essentially morph that into a thriller, or into, at least you've, you've given it thriller elements. Existing thriller subcategories pose no boundaries for you. Uh, many prolific authors, like Jack Higgins is an example, they, they go right across the boundary. You get, uh, he does World War II novels, he does contemporary spy novels, all sorts of things. Al, uh, um, Alistair MacLean I mentioned, Wilbur Smith, Stephen King. All of these people have jumped over genres back and forth. Uh, many individual books can cross or blend genres. My first book has romantic suspense elements to it. Uh, Hunter also has spy, a spy background in it. And it's set in the current criminal justice system. So you get, and there's politics involved in it too. So you can mix and blend anything. And creative novelists are constantly carving out new categories, uh, and new subgenres. All they have to do is come up with a fresh setting. One thing that I would suggest to you, and this is an aside, uh, I uh, sometimes give talks about branding and author branding. If you want to distinguish yourself in the marketplace, carving out a new genre for yourself a subgenre by utilizing the same essential elements but finding a new setting, something fresh, a fresh twist, and all of a sudden, this is what Clancy did with techno thrillers. 
There was a, a genre called techno thrillers pretty much before I think Michael Crichton and, and Tom Clancy came along. And then, all of a sudden, tons of people start going in and doing those same things. All the high technology stuff and military technology and hardware and the details about that. Um, these people carved out an entirely new genre. And um, you can think of Harry Potter as a thriller in a sense. Any of the Harry Potter stories, they have classic structure of a thriller. But what is it? It's kids in a wizarding school, new setting. And she came up with a whole new genre, or at least one that if not entirely new, she certainly carved it out as something fresh and different. And in doing so, uh, she spawned countless imitators and people who are following in her footsteps, um, just as Tolkien did in Lord of the Rings. Adventure stories, and all, so many different thriller elements in that. Now, there are some common, I'm going to uh, take just a, a, a couple of minutes to talk about some common universal thriller plot themes, as I call it. Someone has something that somebody else badly wants. Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. Maltese Falcon, it's this ceramic bird. Everybody is going after something, and the plot conflict grows out of the fact that there's this clash over competing interests who want something. It could be a secret formula, whatever. Um, Alfred Hitchcock would call these things the MacGuffin in his stories. It didn't matter what it was, really. The Maltese Falcon, nobody cares about the bird. It's the, it's the clash of the interesting characters. Two, someone has information that somebody else doesn't want them to have. The born identity. Uh, the man who knew too much, another Hitchcock story. Literally, he knew too much. Uh, it makes them dangerous to some, somebody's interest, and therefore the clash in the thriller stems out of that. And there's a variation on that. Someone has witnessed something that makes him a threat to somebody else. Think of the Harrison Ford film Witness, where the little Amish boy sees a murder. Uh, same thing happens to a burglar in David Baldacci's Absolute Power, where somebody knows something that they shouldn't know. Somebody has seen something that they shouldn't have seen, and that knowledge makes them targets. Someone is planning something terrible, and the hero must stop them. And this was the essentially the, the plot of every single episode of the TV series 24. <laughs> We are running out of time! <laughs> remember, remember Jack was, every episode, we are running out of time, you know, because the end of the world was going to come. Nukes, um, biological warfare, assassination of the president, it was always something. This guy never had a good day, ever. <laughs> um, uh, Jack Bauer, Jack Bauer, uh, it was always, he's running out of time because something terrible is about to happen and Jack is the only human being in the history of civilization who's capable of stopping it. He's, I, I describe uh, Jack Bauer as a uh, sort of a hybrid of Achilles and Job, you know, because <laughs> long suffering. It, 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 he he really he had all the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune in every episode. Um, it's a storyline of Homeland on uh, HBO. Uh, something terrible is about to happen, and you've got to stop it. Someone is anointed, ordered, or asked to participate in a high-stakes mission where the odds of survival are very small. Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Guns of Navarone, The Matrix, Star Wars, The Magnificent Seven, The Dirty Dozen, The Fifth Element, in every case, you have a story in which somebody is anointed, ordered, or asked to participate in a high-stakes mission where the odds of survival are very small. Uh, another variation, somebody is drawn unwittingly into the middle of a secret plot, although often nobody believes them. Um, and he or she must figure out what's happening, fight for his life and or those of others, defeat the bad guys, and reclaim his reputation for sanity. 
Jody Foster in Flight Plan. See the movie Flight Plan. Uh, Lee Child's Killing Floor. Robert Ludlum's The Born Identity, where nobody, be you know, nobody believes the, the, the character who's involved in that. Uh, a typical uh, variation in uh, crime fiction, whether it's John D. McDonald, Parker, or, you know, uh, 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 Robert B. Parker, Mickey Spillane, Robert Crace. Someone walks into the hero's office and hires him for a job that turns out to be much more than he bargained for. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it, it's always seen on the 50s, it was the dame walked into the room, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> She walked in with, uh, with, uh, with two miles of leg, and, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, it, you just have to love the, the language there. It's so sexist. You know. um, at any rate, um, typically in those kinds of stories, the protagonist finds themselves initially or eventually to be manipulated and then must turn the tables, take the initiative, and defeat the schemers. And a, a seventh example I can think of is some terrible wrong has been inflicted on the protagonist or somebody he loves, and he seeks justice or revenge. This is a common uh, element in all vigilante stories, and there are an abundance of those. And uh, that's also a common element in, in my stories, which are vigilante crime thrillers. Common thriller protagonists that you can pick from. The everyman, sometimes he's even a loser, who has to rise to the occasion and stand up to evil or calamity. I think of uh, the architect Paul Kersey in Brian Garfield's classic Death Wish. Luke Skywalker in Star Wars. Um, there are boundless examples of that. Or there's the damaged hero who has to overcome inner demons or wounds in order to redeem himself. You think of David Morrell's Rambo character in First Blood, or Mel Gibson's unhinged cop in the Lethal Weapon stories. There's the capable hero who's thrown into new, uncomfortable circumstances, where, uh, where he's in or out of, or whether he's out of his death. Um, Dan Brown's Robert Langdon, <clears throat> Bruce Willis in the Die Hard movies. The mysterious, strong, silent type with hid hidden talents and secret skills. Stephen Hunter's Bob Lee Swagger. Lee Child's Jack Reacher. The shipboard cook in Under Siege, played by Steven Seagal. Turns out to be a Navy SEAL. And my own thriller hero, Dylan Hunter. All cut from essentially the same cloth. Now, what is the structure of the thriller? Uh, I use, and it is very common to have this three-act plot formula, the hero's journey. And for anyone who wants to know what that's all about, I recommend a great book, uh, Christopher Vogler, V-O-G-L-E-R. It's called The Writer's Journey. Uh, this guy is a Hollywood script doctor, and he employs these things to, uh, to make, uh, make Hollywood movies much more exciting. It works like this. Uh, the thrillers and in, in their heroes usually conform to the heroic quest pattern. Film examples would be The Matrix, Star Wars, High Noon, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Shane, Jaws. Classic three-act plot contains the setup, escalating disasters, and a climax that resolves everything. In Act One, the setup takes up maybe the first uh, one-fifth to one-quarter of the book. It introduces the lead characters and the story world. The hero is in his normal world, whether he's the detective in the office when there's a knock at the door, uh, whether it's um, uh, the Keanu Reeves character, Neo, and uh, all of a sudden on his computer screen, wake up, Neo. There is something, a call to adventure, that happens in all of these stories. Something, uh, uh, Luke Skywalker meets Obi-Wan, and Obi-Wan says, you must come to, the, to uh, uh, Dagobah, whatever, and learn the ways of the Force, Luke. Um, and, and there's always the summons, the call to adventure. And the hero is often reluctant at first. 
Um, the hero or heroine may refuse the call, but at the end of Act One, there is a major disaster in which the hero is compelled, propelled into action. And at that point, there's no turning back for the hero. And this establishes the story question that, that sets up the suspense for a thriller. And that is, will the hero survive? Will the hero prevail? And that has to be a step. The, the stakes have to be established early on. The villain and the opposition have to be established early on. And that is all set up in Act 1. Act 2, that takes up the bulk of the book, maybe 50% of the book. Um, in pursuit of the, object, uh, of the objective, whether it's the defeat of the bad guys or whatever, the hero or heroine encounters tests, allies, enemies, challenges, perils that escalate. And during that period of time, it escalates. The tension is ramped up for the reader. Uh, in the midpoint of the story, there's often a turning point a, a second disaster. There was the first one that summoned them in at the end of Act 1. In the middle of Act 2, there's usually another real devastating thing, a setback that the hero faces that uh, makes his mission in doubt. Um, uh, in the Guns of Navarone, uh, one of the guys climbing up the cliff breaks his leg. Uh-oh. Now they've got to carry around the guy of their five-man team they have to carry around a guy who can't function. What's going to happen? And, and this happens in the, around the middle of the story. So you go, oh my gosh, how's the hero going to survive this? It's the darkest time, and then he has to make a decision. Is he going to fall back, or is he going to proceed? The hero or heroine proceeds at that point. They make the decision to proceed, and they make a commitment. And in Act 3, takes up the final fifth or quarter of the story. It includes a climax or resolution. After preparations, the protagonist and the antagonist, they've had mutual preparations. They have to meet and clash in final confrontation. It tests the protagonist's skill, his character, his resolve. You don't know what the outcome's going to be. It's very scary, um, but the story question is answered. If it's a tragedy, he's defeated. If it's if more often than not in a, in a thriller, it's a success. And the hero succeeds, he triumphs, and then at the end of the third act, it's more or less a winding down, tying up loose ends, um, emotional satisfactions. They, yeah, subplots are tied up uh, at that point. Your goal as a thriller writer, your ultimate objective is to keep your re reader riveted inside your story world. Riveted there. Completely entranced at all times. Gripped by suspense. Unaware of his surroundings. He's down in that story world. And continuing to turn the pages. So, the iron rule of writing a thriller, or any good story for that matter, the iron rule is never, ever do anything to distract the reader back into the real world. I'd say that applies to any kind of fiction, really. What could that be? That could be typos in your manuscript, by the way. That could be, um, that could be you have a clever turn of phrase. Oh, you love this. You love this line. Oh, you love, or, or you're so clever, you're going to come up. Suddenly, the reader is aware not of the story world. They're not down there. They're aware of the author and how clever the author is. And the, the, you yank them out of the story when you do that. You should be like the projector in the back of the theater. You should be setting out the, the, the images, sending out the story keeping people in rapt attention and not intruding into the story by showing off. So if you're distracting, uh, you have any quirks of phrase and things like that that distract the reader out of the spell of the story, 
you're making a serious mistake. All the rules and techniques of craftsmanship and writing exist only to establish or to enhance the five elements that I've talked to, uh, to you about. High stakes, escalating perils, mounting suspense, relentless pacing, courageous actions by the hero to resolve any story questions. Now, I'm only gonna take about five minutes to run through some, some crafts, uh, craftsmanship points because I wanna give you folks time to ask what you wanna ask about. And I'll just touch on some of them here. You have a list and you can go through them and I think most of them are pretty self-explanatory. And there are some great books that I suggest at the end which will give you more information. I think you, in a good thriller, it's smart to pick an evocative title that suggests the genre. Where Eagles Dare, Consent to Kill, American Assassin, Die Trying, things like that tell the person, yeah, you're, that's the genre, you're in the middle of a thriller. Uh, Mary Higgins Clark had, I think, the perfect title for her thing. Where Are the Children? Now that's a title that tells you the whole story question sets up the question before the person has even opened the book. You know what the story is about. I, I was brave. Great, great, great uh, title. Um, but it suggests what's going on. I think Jaws is a great title too, really evocative. I think it's useful to know your ending or destination before you start out writing. Now I have, tend to be very much of an outliner, very strong, OCD outliner of everything in advance. Not everybody is. Um, Lee Child isn't. Vince Flynn, late Vince Flynn, was not. Uh, there are people who are. Robert Ludlum was. Uh, Robert Crace is a, is a heavy outliner. Ken Follett is a heavy outliner. Doesn't matter. One thing that is good to know, though, is your destination, because then it provides some cohesion when you're writing. Uh, you know where you're building the suspense to. And if you know the resolution of your story, it's a matter then of, of connecting the dots from wherever the, the, the character is at the very beginning to where you want to bring them. High stakes involve big ideas and issues, and those big ideas and issues usually require larger than life characters, or if they're ordinary characters at the <coughs> outset, they have to start taking larger than life actions. So make sure that these elements are scaled appropriately to the size of your characters. You don't want people to be doing unbelievable <clears throat> things. Establish the story question, the issue to be resolved. The high stakes, the central conflict very early, very, very early in the story, to hook the reader before he even gets far into the story. When you are, um, and that's especially true now if you are publishing and so much of it is sold online, Amazon, for example, they have the, you have the ability to, to read the opening pages of the book by clicking on the cover. If you do not hook a thriller reader, a browsing customer, within the first couple of pages, Forget about it. You lost them. You have to make sure that your first pages that you start in the middle of the action, that you start establishing some jeopardy and also something about a character that, that the uh, reader can identify with. And you've got to set that up early because that's the expectation of thriller readers. You might want to try storyboarding your plot. What do I mean by that? Um, being able to visualize the scenes. If you put up um, on note cards, you lay, lay out the plot points that you want along the way. Okay, where it, it, I have on the back of the uh, uh, handout a graph of that three-act structure. If you want to come up with scene ideas and lay them out on a line on the, on the floor or just draw them, uh, there are software, pieces of software like Scrivener or the one that I use, Write It Now, that allow you to come up with picture storyboards. And that's the way they make films. They oftentimes, the, the writers will put out card after card after card, and they'll put them up on a blackboard, and they'll move things around to see how they, 
how you can ramp up the suspense along the way, where you can come down in the, in the attention, and where to ramp it up again. And it's very useful uh, as, as a uh, technique. Start the thriller with action and not with backstory, descriptions, and information dumps. Information dump is when uh, you think you have to start explaining things about the setup of the story and the background and, and the circumstances up front. Bad idea. Very bad idea. Hook the reader first. Get them curious about continuing to turn the pages, and then you can explain all of the details they'll need to know later on. Uh, perfect example of that, the opening of Raiders of the Lost Ark, if you're familiar with the movie. Yeah. This guy's in the middle of the jungle. You don't know who he is. He's a scruffy looking guy with the Indiana Jones hat. I forgot my Indiana Jones hat today. <laughs> I didn't bring it with me. Um, he, he's in the middle of the jungle with these guys, and he's creeping along, and he's going through all the blowgun darts and things like that, and collapsing bridges. And everything is going wrong, and you have no idea who he is and what, is, what this movie's all about. But you're captivated. And you're curious right up front. And then as the movie proceeds, it's explained to you. It's revealed to you. That's what you're looking for. If you want to think of how to open up a story, a thriller, <clears throat> start in the middle of the action rather than an explanation. You know, the, and no once upon a time stuff. People don't want that in a thriller. They want to be grabbed uh, early. Uh, some other things I'll just touch on in about two minutes, and then we'll get to questions. Um, End scenes and chapters on some point of suspense. If you want people to keep turning pages, when they get to the end of a, uh, of, of a scene, you don't want the scene to be have a resolution. You want it to set up something else, a point of curiosity, a point of suspense, a cliffhanger, something that is going to compel the reader to go and look at the next page. Um, give your hero a limited time to solve the problem and then shorten it. <laughs> um, the, the important thing uh, when, you're, when you're doing a thriller, the important thing is you want the tension to be ramped up and ramped up. And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, suddenly you find out, oh, the, the airplane that the hero is using to get to the scene to, to the, of the rescue, the airplane runs out of gas. It's run out of fuel, and it's going down now. He has to not only solve the problem, that problem, but then he has to get to, to do the rest of the mission. You continue to up the stakes and compress the time, and that drives readers nuts, but it will keep them turning the pages. Um, Lee Child said, write the slow stuff fast and the fast stuff slow. He means cut, summarize, and move rapidly past unimportant events, like moving characters from place to place between scenes. You, know, you, don't, you don't need to tell people, OK, he got in the car and he, he drove across town. The traffic was heavy, blah, blah, blah. Cut to the next scene. People will figure, oh, he must have driven over there. And they'll figure that out. There's nothing really dramatic or exciting in driving. You know? <laughs> so get, get to the point. And, and when you're starting up a scene, it's not he walked into the office, he made himself comfortable, so-and-so was there, and so on. No, start right in the middle of the dialogue. Start right in the middle of the scene. Cut to the chase. Get to the meat of things. And when he says, write the fast stuff slow, what does he mean? When you get to an action scene, or a suspense scene, or something like that, drag it out. That's when, OK, that's when uh, uh, the, he's, you know, the, the sweat starts trickling down the hero's face. And, uh, and he smells the, 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 you know, the, the smell of gunpowder from well, wafting across the field and all. That's when you start getting the detail, and that's when you start dragging things out and really make it, uh, make it excruciating. Because that's where the reader wants to be. He doesn't want to be driving across town. He wants to be down in those scenes. So write the fast stuff 
the things, the, the frenetic action, go down into all the little tiny details. You can keep chapters relatively short. Some people, I mean, Robert P. Parker, he, he had chapters sometimes like two paragraphs long. Short, punchy sentences. Um, avoiding excessive details, description, and dialogue. Again, economize. Don't show off your research, information dumps on research. Uh, one thing I'll, I'll say, and, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, a thriller isn't always about plot. And it isn't only about plot or mainly about plot. Readers forget plots. They never forget an indelible character. How many Sherlock Holmes stories can you recite the plot structure to? How many Jack Reacher novels do you know the plot structure? Do you remember what happened in which book? Nobody remembers that stuff. They're, they love the roller coaster ride while it's there, but at the end of the day, what they love is Sherlock Holmes and Jack Reacher. They love these iconic characters, whether it's Miss Marple or whatever. They, they love the characters. Make this about primarily focus in on the site on the characters and make come up with these characters that you, people will care about make them three-dimensional uh, make sure that the villain is equal to the challenge of the hero make the villain big scary ominous a real powerful threat because there's nothing that diminishes the stature of your hero more than not having high stakes that he has to he has to fight against. I'm going to just stop right there, um, and I talked about the brand business about coming up with something unique, and that's probably the most important thing I can say about the thriller writing career. But I'm going to just stop at this point and let you ask any kind of questions you want. Also, I am available at various points during the day. Stop me, grab me at lunch. Um, I may or may not go to the next session, to somewhere in the next session, if you have specific questions you want to ask. But are, are there questions, comments, questions? Yes, sir. A lot of writers, you know, will have a plot and several subplots. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be like, you know, this chapter is the plot, subplot, plot, subplot. Um, when you write, do you write straight through, or do you write like, all the stuff for the plot, all the stuff for the subplot. Wow, that's a good question. That is a very good question. Um, I kind of know where the, the, the arc of the subplot and the arc of the, the main plot, I, I know. And if you're using storyboard techniques or something, you can lay those out independently on the, on the floor or of your home or on a blackboard, chalkboard or whatever, or just scribble them out on paper. And if you know in your outline where you're going, it really doesn't matter whether you're, I tend to write from the beginning to the end, straight through. But I know what, what those things are, and I've already figured out, all right, I ended at a point of tension and suspense at the end of a scene with the main plot. Now, I'm going to let the reader dangle on the hook, and I'm going to go down into the subplot, and they're going to hate me for it. Because, but they're going to turn the pages, you know. But now the subplot, you've got to make it interesting. You better make that have that the subplot has to have its own arc and its own suspense. Um, in my novels, the, there's the, the, a constant interaction between the uh, in, in Hunter here. There was a tension. If you've ever seen the movie The Thomas Crown Affair, either version of it, you know that movie. There is, the, the plot is essentially a man and a woman. The man is an, is an art thief, billionaire art thief. He does it for fun. He doesn't need the money, he doesn't need the art, but he, he, he's a, he just loves the caper. And the woman is an insurance claims investigator. At the very beginning, it's a cat and mouse thing. The mouse knows she's the cat, the cat knows He's the mouse. They fall in love anyway, you know. But it's a cat and mouse interplay to the thing. And the suspense is, oh my gosh, what's going to happen with these people? They're in love and so forth. In Hunter, it's a cat and mouse 
plot structure on the personal level. But the cat does not know she's the cat. Or no, she, she knows she's a cat. She doesn't know he's the mouse. The mouse doesn't know she's the cat. So you've got two people who fall in love, have no idea they are the last people on the planet who should fall in love. And you like these two characters. You really, really like these characters. I build them up in such a way that you really admire them and love them. And the, sh the horror there on that personal level, the personal uh, end of the plot, which is really the subplot, is, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to these two wonderful people when they find out who they really are and what's happening to them? It's horror. The main plot is a vigilante crime spree is occurring in Washington, D.C., and nobody knows who's doing it. And you've got this mysterious journalist who's writing newspaper articles and, uh, about criminal justice aberrations and, and bad guys, and the people he write about, it writes about keep turning up dead. The criminals he writes about keep turning up dead, and copies of his newspaper articles are left at the scene of the crime. And the police are going, you know, what's going on here? And the police confront him, and he said, they said, what? You know, uh, and and uh, they describe what's happening at the scenes of the crime. And so you've got this. That's the main plot. What's happening? Who's who's doing the killing here, and, and what's going on? But the subplot is this love story, this cat and mouse love story. If you establish the suspense line for each one, the main story and the subplot then people won't feel cheated when they go into the subplot because they're just as eager to figure out what's going to happen on a personal level as they are the, the mega plot, the big, the, the scary plot, you know, the, the over, overarching plot. So I keep weaving back and forth between the two and you got to trust your gut on this. You write for a while and you say, your inner clock starts saying, you know, am I getting too preachy here, too talky? Too much dialogue here. I got it. Am I going to? If I were a reader, would I start losing interest at this point? And just at the point where you think you might start to lose interest, change the scene, go to something else, and and, and get back into something that is going to be interesting again. Um, it, it's you get that from reading a lot of thrillers, really good ones. If you read really good thrillers and lots of them, you'll start internalizing a clock after a while. And you'll know where a scene is going on a little too long, or a chapter has gone on a little too long. Or you spent too much time on the main plot and you haven't gotten back to the subplot. Um, or too much time on the subplot and, you haven't, and you're, you've lost track of the main plot. Um, I had in uh, my second novel, uh, uh, Bad Deeds, um, I had to set up s two really boring things at the beginning of the story. Um, where the villain, uh, a villain, or one of the two main villains, is talking to his gang and setting things up. It's like conspiracy braggadocio type thing. And I also had, to, had um, for the reader's sake, I had to explain a technical thing at length because it's complicated. How did I handle it? I decided to do a tennis match where I'd have a short scene of the bad guys together and, and the, bad, uh, the chief bad guy talking to his troops. And I would let it go on only so long and then I'd cut away and go back to the other technical thing. And I kept changing the scenes and I tried to make them as interesting as I could on their own. But I kept going back and forth so that the reader, if I had extended those out too long, it would have gotten boring. And in Hunter, I have the big <coughs> reveal, which takes place in a, a very long, it could have been one really, really long chapter. I wrote it up instead at a normal size chapter length, and then I chopped it off at a dramatic point and did a flashback an explanatory flashback scene that was good on its own as a separate chapter that I sandwiched in and then I cut out of the flashback and came back to what would have been an enormous chapter. I came back with a separate chapter for the last half of it. 
it's a matter of pacing. The pace has to be relentless. You have to be constantly having that inner clock, and you get you get the, a sense of it if you read a lot of really good thrillers. Um, I don't know whether we're we're right near the end here um, of the time. Any other questions before I go? Yes, sir. As a self-publisher, uh, do you feel the need for, and if you do, how do you handle the editorial functions and people reviewing and so forth? Uh, different subject, but uh, uh, I basically I get a lot of really skilled beta readers. I mean, people who were either published authors themselves or past editors, plus people who are really familiar with the thriller genre. And I get those people to um, um, look over my manuscripts, tell me, where did I lose you? I ask them questions. Where did it get boring for you? Um, what drags? They saved my butt. Because you're, you get too close to your work and you can't see these things. But my betas, and I have a lot of them, I, I have them crawling like locusts over my manuscript. <laughs> and I, I gotta tell you, every single one of them, I can have 20 people there. And one person out of the 20 will pick up something that I go, oh, I found one in Hunter, chapter two. And I fixed it now in the ebook version of so on, and in the, and in the new edition of this that's out. Chapter two, a guy walks into a car in an underground parking garage, puts on his seatbelt, um, turns over the key, turns on the radio, and he hears something shocking on the radio. The scene goes on as he's thinking and about the implications. And, and, and he's really angry and, and so forth. And then at the end of the scene, he puts on his seatbelt. Again. <laughs> Thousands of people read that chapter. <laughs> All of my betas read the chapter. I read it a hundred times. Nobody picked that up. My best friend picked it up. And I went, ah! Put on his seatbelt twice in the same scene. The betas saved my butt. Uh, they come over and over and over and over again, and and um, and uh, yeah. if you pick the, the literate ones, you can hire editors, but they're expensive. You know. I was going to say, is this done? The betas are is that done as a sort of a professional reciprocity arrangement, or do you have? To I offer them? them free copy of the book. I offer them acknowledgments in the back of the book. Uh, their name will be acknowledged in the back of the book. So they will get a signed, inscribed copy of the book and, and uh, an acknowledgement in the back. You'll be amazed at how many people are willing to, willing to volunteer for something like that. So. Um, do you ask them to do reviews often? Here's what I do about reviews. I think you have to be very careful. I do not go solicit people out of the blue to do reviews for me. If someone comes to me and says, I read your book and really loved it, then after the fact, I may ask them, say, thank you so much. I hope you share your, your joy of the book with other people. Um, one thing that would really help me is if you shared it online, if you shared it on, on Amazon or something. But I do not go to relatives and say, Could, I really need, you know, I really need a review. Give me a good review on it. Give me five stars. I, I think that's wrong. I don't swap reviews with other authors. As a matter of fact, I've, I've really gotten hesitant about reviewing books because there's, man, you, you get a friend who sends you a book and then they expect a review. And then they expect a five star review. And if there's not a great book, it puts you in a very compromised position. I don't like that. I don't like to be in that position. So, but I, I think it's wrong. It devalues the entire review process when you do that. I think we're supposed to start getting out of here. But it, like, as I said, I'll be happy to spend time with any of you afterwards or at lunch. Thanks very much.